In the heart of Central Africa, inside a country with a long history of upheaval, exists a rare group of big cats, the tree-climbing lions of Ishasha. Numbering just over two dozen animals, these few remaining lions are under threat from cattle ranching in an ever-shrinking territory. Lions just come to eat, to eat our cows. They don't come just for good things. No. People seek retribution and more lions die. It's a battle between an age-old predator and an ever-growing population of humans. Ironically, these very lions may prove to be the salvation of Western Uganda's wildlife and national parks. I've come here to locate these unusual lions and join local biologist Dr. Andy Plumtree on a mission to capture and collar the big cats. Can we get people into the cars? <laughs> it is dangerous. They can wake up much quicker than... Okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> As a biologist, I travel the world through some of the toughest terrain, researching animals to better understand their behavior. Now, I'm on a mission to find the biggest and baddest creatures on the planet. I'm Niall McCann, and I'm here in the southwest corner of Uganda, searching for the tree-climbing lions of Ishasha. Since the Idi Amin regime in the 1970s, followed by civil war in the 1990s, Uganda's wildlife has suffered huge declines. In the country's largest park, Queen Elizabeth, elephant, hippo and giraffe populations are a fraction of their former size, and only 140 lions remain. In the southern Ashasha area, only two dozen. While human populations surge and cattle provide status and revenue, now a new blight on the land is accelerating the conflict between farmers and hungry lions in the park. There is no more iconic and culturally significant animal than the lion. But lions are struggling, and conflict with people has seen their numbers decline by 30% in the last few years. Here in Uganda, an invasive and inedible species of plant growing in the communal grazing lands surrounding the national parks has forced farmers to move their cattle inside the park boundaries. Occasionally, lions eat the cows, and in revenge, Lions are killed by the farmers. So I've joined forces with a team of researchers who are trying to resolve this conflict by putting GPS collars on members of one of the most unique populations of lions anywhere in Africa, the tree-climbing lions of Ishasha. In order to find the small population of lions in this vast area, I'm heading south across the park to meet with biologist Andy Plumtree and his team. Where possible, They'll replace worn-out collars and use the transmitter's signal to locate the pride. They use this uh, radio system to basically pick up the lion collars. We have two lions that are down here that have got collars on. We have got to find a suitable candidate for collaring, and we begin by following the faint signal of the previously collared female. Then, something catches my eye. We've come across these fantastic tracks, which are relatively fresh, but it would have been sometime yesterday. And heading along this way, they start on the far side of the road, and then they cross and head that way. And then they've gone down into the ravine off in that direction. Finding a, one of 24 lions in a massive national park is pretty well, yeah, I mean, very this, difficult. This area is 450 square kilometers. It's huge. Large. As the collared lion in the ravine is known to have cubs and is thus a risky candidate, the next option is to return to one of the large fig trees where the Ashasha lions often congregate. We were looking for a female lion of maybe about six years old, there or thereabouts, and we found one. Would this one be a candidate for putting a radio collar on? Yeah, um, she's an adult female, or pretty much adult. She's just going from sort of adult to adult, and um, we're looking for a female that's likely to stay in the pride and not move elsewhere. So she would be a prime candidate, because she's going to probably live several years, and the colour will last about three years, so... The females live 10 to 15 years out of the wild? Yeah, about that. Andy has a number of theories about why these lions climb trees. Escape from the heat, flies, but perhaps most importantly, 
Ishasha has an unusual number of accessible fig trees with large branches, as opposed to thorny acacia trees found elsewhere in Africa. Lions just find them comfortable. What we want to do with the colouring is set up something called experiential tourism, which is basically tourists will pay extra to go out in a special vehicle to get up close to the lions. Some of that proceeds of what they pay will go and support community projects and potentially compensation for livestock loss as well. So we would have to wait for her to come down to the ground before trying to dart her, presumably? Yeah, yeah, we, there's no way we'd dart her in the tree. With a great candidate picked out, we have to wait till the next day for the arrival of the regional vet. We head out across the park at dawn the next day in search of our lioness. In the late 1960s, Queen Elizabeth National Park had the largest biomass, or animals by weight, in the world. Today, despite appearances, it's a small fraction of that. We find Jane, the lioness from the tree, with a hunting partner, a younger female. The veterinary team prepares the tranquilizer. Margaret is our vet, who's going to be tranquilizing the lion. And they're currently just going through the rather complex maths to figure out exactly what dose they need to give a lion of a certain size. Of course, the reason we're doing this is to affix a transmitter collar with GPS around her neck, which every eight hours will be beaming a signal of exactly where she is so that Andy and the rest of his team can monitor the movements of the pride around this part of Queen Elizabeth National Park, better inform the local communities of where the lions are moving so they can alter where they move their livestock as well. It's a critical part of the conservation of this highly endangered species here in Uganda. Heading towards the line now. It's just down there. You can see the lion's head sticking up just to the right of the acacia tree. So we're moving around to about 20 meters away. Margaret has a clear shot. The lion just yawned. Massive teeth like that. There's two, and we're aiming for the one on the right, which is slightly older. It, it has to get out. It has to get it up. So the lioness is lying down. It can easily deflate. We just need her to sit up, and then Margaret will be able to get the dart straight into the muscular part of her thigh, hopefully. Started, but now they've just totally calmed down. So brilliant shot, Margaret. Now we wait maybe 15 or 20 minutes and then she should, should be fully under. I think she's getting drowsy. The head yeah. is down. Yeah, her head down. Yeah. So the head has gone down, so we'll That's... give her maybe another minute. Using the truck, we have to isolate the lion to be collared as the younger one may rush in to defend her downed partner. Just need to keep an eye where she went. Here's the stick, Margaret. Yeah. Now we have to see if the downed lion is really sedated. Andy's just going to poke her to make sure she doesn't respond. Just when we thought it was safe to step out, the lioness shows she's still full of life. We're attempting to sedate and put a GPS collar on an endangered lion in Uganda's Queen Elizabeth Park. So we have this vehicle just to make sure that the other lioness stays away. So we chased her out that way. She banked round, and the last thing we want is her coming back. 
So we've got some of the park rangers just going that way to make sure that she stays away so we can do everything with this lioness in total safety. It's wise to be cautious, since the second lion could sprint in defensively in seconds. Well, Margaret's making sure that the cat can't swallow its tongue. The tongue's out, so she can't possibly choke on it, so she's not going to have any problems while she's under the anaesthetic. So, big, healthy female. <laughs> Mustafa, can you get for me the drug boxes, please? Just making sure that the collar can't come off. So it's it's going to feel quite unusual to her. So she'll try and force it off in the first few days until she gets used to it. And while we're doing this, Margaret's going to perform a range of other basic health checks, blood tests, that type of thing. Temperature, take a blood sample, general assessment of condition. Even ticks are removed to ensure the good health of the lioness. Rangers continue to stand guard, alert to the possibility of a lion charge. Let we have a look at this paw. Absolutely enormous, essentially the size of my hand. And like most cats, they have retractable claws. Like these, so. They tend to keep them up, kept within the rest of the paw, but when they're attacking, they evert those claws and then they're put into action. It's incredibly sharp, about an inch long. So just giving her a bit of iodine, because she's got a wound inside here. And iodine's an incredibly good disinfectant. It kills basically everything. So you're missing a couple of incisors. Oh. Oh. Just, just broken off a couple of incisors. Nothing serious. Not Otherwise, dentition looks really healthy. It seems the lioness is beginning to wake, while guards remain alert for the other one. The park guards have been watching where the other lioness is and just moving to make sure that they stay between us and the lioness so it doesn't come here and cause us any problems. Right, so now we have to get back into the car. Margaret's finished the reversal agent, and that will take effect pretty quickly. And then we monitor the lioness. That was incredibly quick, incredibly efficient. It's been 26 minutes precisely. Collar is on. Job done. Fantastic. Margaret has administered the reversal agent. And then we just have to monitor for a few minutes to make sure she fully regains her coordination. And then. Well, the sun's already gone down. It's starting to get dark. She'll be off out on the hunt. But there's a problem. The anaesthetic is taking much longer than expected to wear off, even after the reversal agent was injected. We've got a storm brewing. But hopefully she'll wake up before that hits us. Can we check on her? OK, you want me to drive up? Yeah. Margaret wants to examine the lion for vital signs, clues to her alertness. Like people, individual lions respond in different ways to anaesthetic, and her full revival could take hours. But with a thunderstorm brewing, the timing could not be worse. Margaret tests for any signs of revival. Exactly 20 minutes since the reversal agent was put in. She's just sleeping like a baby. She's breathing at a really good rate, just deep and steady, constant rate of breathing. So we know she's fine, but you pressed on that pressure point at the end of the tower, she didn't even budge an inch. Margaret would like to give a bit of a top up of reversal, just to try and speed the process up. We can't leave her until she's up and and off and running again because hyenas could come in and, and kill her or she could be hurt in some other way. Margaret makes sure the lion is not awake before stepping out to administer another dose of the revival agent. Whoa, wow, look at that. Fantastic. Finally, she comes around, looking healthy. Mostly she's very relaxed. 
all the sleep had been out and she's got a radio collar on so we'll come back in the morning and find her and just make sure she's doing as well as we hope she is and she's totally calm now anyway next i head north to hear of big cat attacks and the very noxious weed that is affecting the future of the park and the remaining lions the next day we follow the signal from the new collar to check up on our lioness. So we've been looking for this radio collared lioness for three and a quarter hours, and it turns out we've been chasing a reflection of the radio signal, which Andy had predicted all along. And what she's done is head off into a ravine, so the signal was easily lost, and must be bouncing off various other things, sending us on a merry dance around the park. There she is. It was great to see the female that we collared last night sitting and just relaxing underneath the tree. It's just gone midday, so it's the hottest part of the day and she's quite rightly taken a bit of shade in order to rest and recuperate. She's not far from where we collared her, but she's bright and alert and the collar seems to be well fitted and she's not itching at it. So it seems to have been highly successful, which is fantastic. Heading back across the southern Ishasha region of the park, I come across a different kind of formidable creature. So although I'm here in the savannas of Uganda looking for what is largely regarded as one of the most dangerous animals in the whole world, the lion, in reality, <laughs> these things are almost as bad. So these are African army ants. The reputation that these have is absolutely fearsome. I've heard rumours of babies literally being carried out of their cots and off to be devoured over towards where the army ants have their nest. And I know for sure that whole grown animals that have been kept caged have been stripped of all their flesh, so there's absolutely nothing left simply overnight. In some parts of Africa, they're actually used as sutures. So if you have a, a wound, like a gash down your head, you can hold these soldiers up to the wound and they'll just clamp on. They'll clamp onto anything that's in front of them. It's a bit of grass and it's nailed that. And they'll clamp on and they'll pin your wound so well together that it acts in exactly the same way as a stitch would. If you have a long wound, simply use half a dozen ants and then let your wound heal as it would after a visit to the doctor. My journey to understand the human-lion conflict takes me north. Some of the pastoralist communities live right on the edge of the park boundary itself. And it's these communities that are suffering the greatest loss of their livestock as a result of predation by the lions, but also these communities that are most heavily persecuting the lions in revenge. Raising cattle is part of the fabric of these communities and I want to find out how these pastoralists are coping with lions in their midst. Even as an invasive plant, it's only making matters worse. Introduced as an ornamental plant by European settlers, the toxic Lantana camara has spread across the land. In effect, forcing farmers to seek safer grazing inside the national parks, exposing them to lions. These pillars mark the boundary of Queen Elizabeth National Park. And they're every 100 or 150 meters or so, more or less all the way around. But as you can see, there's essentially no difference between this side in the National Park and that side in the communal grazing areas. And this is where the farmers are moving their cattle in. And they're moving in, coming into contact with the lions, and the lions are following them back out. And then the lions are actually taking the cattle, not only inside the park, but right next to the villages as well. When the lion come to attack this crowd, I have dogs. So when the dogs bark, they make noise, then I wake up. I just chase the, the lion with my dog. <laughs> As I reach the, uh, the lion, just give it a cane, then it goes. When your cow is 
this is eaten by a lion, then it means you are not going to survive. There's an absolutely enormous number of cattle here, probably over a hundred head of cattle, and they'd all belong to one person. And it might not seem such a bad idea, but these cows, these spectacularly charismatic longhorn cattle are highly non-productive. They do not produce good or much beef and they do not produce much milk either. What would be a far better situation would be if they sold off these cows and replaced them with much more productive cows. Therefore, they need far less in order to get much more out of the same investment. I speak with Nelson Goomer, who manages the park's wildlife, about the dilemma. How do you manage the conflict of, of lions and people? Because lions are taking livestock. How do you go about trying to reduce that, that possibility? There's no policy of compensation. So if the lions uh, eat your livestock, that is certainly not compensated. Now, we try to support the livelihood of these communities. When it is an injury, then we, we, we meet the, the, the medical costs. But we're trying to look at uh, initiatives that would help uh, communities to benefit. Maybe tourism would be one of them. This elder in the village told me they plan to put up a better lighting system in the village to keep lions out of the communities at night. For the time being, there may be an even easier solution. Eliminate the invasive plant. Benjamin, part of the Wildlife Conservation Society team, is supporting local initiatives to remove the toxic lantana from traditional grazing areas around the park. This community, the pastoral community. How much of an issue is the lantana? It, does it cover a large area of a grazing land? Yeah, it was two thirds of their land was covered by lantana kama in this community, two thirds. At least now they are going at least less than that. With fewer plants deadly to grazing cattle, it's hoped that the locals will keep their herds outside of the park and away from the lions. When I head back south to Ashasha to resume the lion collaring, I come across a massive python with a nasty Whoa. temper. It's day four of our lion study in Uganda's Queen Elizabeth National Park. Heading out this morning, I get two surprises. First, we're stopped dead in our tracks by a herd of very territorial elephants. Next, there's news of a giant python sighting, which I have to check out. So it's just after dawn, and we're going to just spread out and try and find it, and then see what state it's in. And there's some birds alarm calling over there, which could be an indication but we'll have to see. But I'm going to check this area brush first and just hope there's no lions. Local rangers said the python had just eaten a cob antelope and was crossing the road. It could be anywhere in this underbrush. A small hole there, too small for it to have got into. It looks like the guides have found a clue. So you can see path through the bush. If that was a mammal path, it would be flattened from the top as opposed to just underneath with this corridor left above it. Evidence of snakes. Well, I found it. <laughs> and from this angle, it looks enormous. So <laughs> now you get that kind of sense in your stomach of the butterfly starting and you just don't know what's going to happen. All right, you can see where it's eaten. Tail here. Here is the head. It's big, so based on its head size, I would say it's probably around 11 to 12 feet. So what I'm going to do is just try and encourage it out without actually having to manhandle it out. Then we can have a good look at it. 
here it comes. Hello. These guys are notoriously aggressive. Just maniac, lunatic, aggressive, that type of thing. But as well as that, they have just an incredible strike length. Here she comes. Oh. Whoa! I don't want to handle it too roughly because it's eaten and I don't want it to regurgitate its food. <clears throat> so ideally I can just kind of encourage it out so we can get a good look. There we go. Leave the cameraman alone. Oh, get that stick out of your mouth. There we go. Yeah, so its strike distance is to about a foot away from me at the moment. Uh, it's probably best it stays that way, but I'll try and encourage her out if I can. They'll strike anywhere at the body. I know of people that have been bitten around the legs and even the torso by these. And with a, something like a cob, as soon as it's got it fixed, basically the cob's dead. And then once the cob has actually been asphyxiated, it will be swallowed head first. And it's amazing, you can actually see all of the different lumps of the cob's body. You can see where its head is, which is only about a metre back from the, the tip of the tail of the snake. It's swallowed it pretty quickly. Helps that they've got an enormous stomach. Well, it's an amazing encounter. I'm incredibly lucky to have seen her. And because she's so full, I don't want to stress her out any more than I already have, just by moving this around and getting a good glimpse of her. I'm just going to have to guess, based on her enormous size, that she is a pretty full-grown female. Probably 20 years old, there or thereabouts. Probably has another 10 years' worth of picking off the cob around this national park in her. Excellent. We'll leave you alone. At the core of saving the lions of Ashasha, is the need to stop villagers' revenge killings, which also affects animals such as hyenas and very rare vultures. So we're going to be actually doing a capture, mark, recapture program here, is that right? Yeah, what, what we've traditionally done is we've done a count once a year, and at this time of year, every year, see the maximum number of vultures you get at a, a kill. Um, and now what we're trying to do is actually capture some of those and do a proper capture mark recapture analysis to see how it compares to the counts we get at a, a killed cow. We're also, I suppose, hoping that some large mammals will come down to the kill as well. Well, there's a good chance lions will turn up at some point, maybe tonight, but um, I think we plan to leave some cameras out, so see if we can capture those. That would be great. One of the, one of the problems that the lions have is when they kill a cow like this, the, the owners of the cow get annoyed, not, not surprisingly. They'll lace them with poison, but what they poison can be anything, so it can be the, the lions or it can be hyenas that turn up or it's often the vultures. Do you know what number of lions have been poisoned in that way in this park? In the last 10 years, it's an estimated about 15 to 20 lions. Oh, that's shocking. Which out of 140 total, that's quite, quite a lot. That's horrendous. I remember you saying 50 vultures were poisoned at a single kill as well. Yes. That's diabolical when you've got... When you've only got 250. That's pretty poor. Going to all these carcasses, yeah. So Dr. Plumtree sets up a vulture count program using a locally butchered cow as bait to monitor the health of the vulture population. I'm setting up our remote cameras to film the vultures and any lions that show up. We wait several hours, but no groups of vultures appear to feed. Something else must have their attention. We decide to leave the carcass to see what shows up in the evening. It's Janet, the mother with cubs, wearing an old radio collar. About 20 minutes before the sun's about to go down, one of the collared lionesses has just come to the cow, which is pretty fantastic. And I just had time to set the camera traps up as well, so I should be getting some pretty amazing footage of her eating from the camera traps which are right next to where the cow is. The reason I think this is important to observe this type of thing is because Lions really are predating quite a lot of cows in the area here in Ishasha, in the Queen Elizabeth National Park, but also all over Africa. One of the most concerning causes of fatality in lions is the poisoning of carcasses on purpose by 
local livestock owners. So a carcass like this would be laced with a form of insecticide and therefore anything that eats on it is gonna die. And that includes lions, includes hyenas, jackals, vultures, and various other species. Anything which touches it is gonna be killed. It's totally indiscriminate and it's a lamentable thing that people are doing this to wildlife. And they're doing it in retribution. And they're doing it in spite, I suppose, in spite because they don't like the fact that there are predators on the lands where they want to graze their cattle. But the national parks and the wildlife that lives inside the national parks in Africa and everywhere in the world are really the most valuable things that are still left on this earth. Not only in terms of revenue gained from ecotourism, the types of people that want to come and see these animals pay a lot of money for the privilege to do so, but also just in terms of intrinsic value. What is the world without its wild places and its wild animals? Then Jane, the lioness we collared, shows up to feed at the carcass. We leave the cameras, hoping some vultures might show up by morning. It's day five in Uganda's Queen Elizabeth Park, and rangers have just told us about an elephant killed by poachers nearby. A meal this big may have fed the vultures for a week and explain why none came to the cow carcass last night. It's incredibly sad. Elephants are hugely intelligent, have very complex social groups and tight family networks. And the loss of an individual like this would be keenly felt by all of its family members and members of the herd. Made even more tragic because it's simply so that some, some loser can have an ivory carving on his desk. I'd like to meet the man. Next, we head back to the cow carcass to see what our cameras might have captured. There's not much left of it, and there's just tiny, tiny little bits of, of the cow over here. The skull's been picked clean. We were here. We were here 12 hours ago, and, and there's nothing left on the skull now. Absolutely nothing. Jump down. And there's the skull. They've destroyed what was an entire cow and there's essentially just the parts that lions find unpalatable left. <laughs> but from what the guys were saying, if hyenas had been here, they'd have eaten through the hooves as well. Right. There's nothing hyenas find unpalatable, more or less. They'd have smashed all the bones to pieces and, and eaten the hooves. At least it gives something for the vultures to come back to. The remote cameras fed no better than the Tooth. cow. Tooth puncture marks in the back. Would, li would lions, that the first thing she did was come and sniff the camera. But she didn't seem too worried about that. No, they've absolutely destroyed this. Yeah. Well, the ch chip is intact, so that's all right. But I've tried turning it on and the rest of it's destroyed. When we do manage to play the file on the card, we see the lion investigating the camera, then picking it up and walking off and finally killing the annoying beast with the blinking infrared eye. They've just destroyed them. I've never, never seen that before. Like, they've absolutely destroyed them. All, all three that we set up have been, one smashed to pieces, smithereens, and the others are completely out of use. In the meantime, Andy's WCS team have located another lion, also wearing an old transmitter collar that needs replacing. What news? So they got a signal the line is still a fair way down that way, but we're going to get the darts all prepared here. OK. So we're all ready to go when we get there. Um, hopefully she'll still be out and not under a bush. There's quite a few obstacles when you're driving off track in Africa. Um, there's ditches, obviously. There's massive termite mounds, and some of them are concealed inside grass, and you don't know it until you nail into one. Yeah, you can see where the vultures are. Yeah. Vultures are a really good signal for us, but other animals in the park also use them as well. So hyenas and, and lions will monitor what the vultures are up to and then will head over there in the hope of finding a, a kill that they can scavenge from. Vultures are taking off over there. We pass an animal boneyard, positive proof that lions are operating in the area.
So she's definitely in the middle of the swamp. We've been circling all the way around the swamp and this signal's going right into the center. We've just done a, a half circuit around it and the signal's been strongest right in the middle. So I think we're gonna drive much closer again, just rule out a few of the bushes that are surrounding the swamp and see where she might have entered or where she might be exiting. The lioness could be anywhere in this tall grass, and it's a short leap to the top of the vehicle. So the lioness was next to us by about a metre. And she just went that way, so we're going to turn to the right and hopefully then flush her out towards where Margaret the vet is. She seems to be in this bit of grass just in front of us to the right, and then between us and the bush. There she is, there she is. There she is. So now we just watch her. She's just gone back into the bush. Over there, or into the swamp right next to that bush. We were supposed to, to cut back her off, but she's back in. Try and cut her off, but we got stuck. Um... She just came back round and back into the swamp again, about 40 metres away. So it's obviously very hot. What we're thinking the best thing to do is to leave her alone now, to head off to another part of the park, and then come back here at about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon when it's cooling, and that she'll be wanting to come out by herself anyway and then we'll try and get her then in the afternoon. We return in the afternoon and find the lioness Daroka right away. Oh, there she is, she's straight ahead. Her old collar is nearly falling off. Dr. Margaret and the veterinary team move in to tranquilize her. in but then I saw it bounce out and the lion just picked the dart up it's gone that way with it in her mouth we'd have we'd have to see the dart in order to be able to tell when the little plastic sleeve has gone down so the lioness has the dart in her mouth she's obviously identified that as being something that bit her and she's keeping hold of it She's laying down just over there. And she's moving. She's moving, that means probably didn't go in. Second time lucky. This dart has to hit the mark if we're going to help out this dwindling lion population. is in. It's in the back leg, exactly where it belongs. So 5.32 in the afternoon. Dart is definitely in. We got it. Fantastic. So it seems as though the lions are actually trying to figure out what it was that just bit her. They're not massively bright, as Andy has emphasised. They tend not to associate the sting with the car that was right next to them. She's currently kind of looking around. She hasn't taken the dart out of her leg yet. And I expect her to go down in the next couple of minutes. It's been a minute and a half since it went in. This is pretty amazing stuff. It's made all the better knowing what an impact this work is actually doing on the conservation of lions here in Uganda and what an impact it's having on the ability of the communities around here to regulate their farming practices by knowing exactly where the lions are going. Daroka is moved out of the hot sun into a cooler shaded area. Okay, down. Slowly down. Slowly down. Slowly. 
Okay. Let's pull her this way. So you can see where the dart went in on her leg there. And we all dab that with iodine just to make sure that no infection could possibly go in there. And I've already cut off the old colour, which I've put down there, which was uh, two or three years old. It was running out of efficacy anyway. And the new ones are simply much better and will last the next three years. So we had to be very careful to make sure that the collar wouldn't come off. But she will play with it. It's something, even though she's had a collar on before, and this one's new, it will feel different and she'll want to aggravate it or agitate it. As before, a complete health check is done. So Mar Margaret's just put a few antibiotic drops onto the wound and injected her with some antibiotics just in case she's suffering any form of bacterial infection and those drops will stop that wound where the dart went in from getting infected so she'll be totally safe. So here's some ticks which were latched onto her. One of the things you have to watch out for when you're working with large mammals, they're surrounded by ticks either on them or just in the habitat where they live. It's now 25 minutes since went in. 26 minutes now, so we still have plenty of time. Once she is unconscious like this, what are you looking for in terms of a, a general health assessment? So normally we would do a body condition score mm -hmm. and say whether it's in excellent condition, good condition, poor condition. What would this condition be? This school. is excellent. She, she seems she's strong, yes. powerful girl. Yeah. <laughs> there are some conditions that would normally cause uh, swellings on the underside. She's able to retract her tongue now. Yeah. <laughs> That's a sign that she's waking up slightly. She's now able to retract yeah. her tongue. So when she's retracting the tongue like this, she's fully awake and we need to be careful. Okay. So Margaret's just doused her with water a little bit, basically just to cool her down because they can overheat when they're under anaesthetic because they can't thermoregulate as well as they can when they're awake. So the last thing to happen is that Margaret's going to put in the reversal agent. At the moment she's probably quite conscious, she just is paralysed at the moment, so the reversal agent will reverse the effect of the anaesthetic and she'll be able to move on her way. Based on the previous lion, I'm expecting a slow recovery. Can we get people into the cars? <laughs> I don't want anyone who's not essential out here because it is dangerous. They can wake up much quicker than sometimes. They can be up in 10, 15 minutes. So we've got to get people out of here. Okay, <laughs> let's go. Perhaps the comatose lion's twitching tongue should have warned us. But since the last one took hours to wake, the film crew and I are feeling relaxed. Can we get people into the cars? <laughs> I don't want anyone who's not essential out here because it is dangerous. They can wake up much quicker than sometimes. They can be up in 10, 15 minutes. So we've got to get people out of here. OK, <laughs> let's go. Whoa. Whoa. Well, well, that was pretty amazing. Just stopped my watch now, one minute 52. So it was under one minute. So under a minute after the reversal agent went in, she was able to sprint. <laughs> Lucky for us, she sprinted that way. <laughs> Just everyone scattered. That was, that, that was pretty amazing. She's just there, but she's watching us very closely. <laughs> That'll get the heart racing. I'm amazed how coordinated she is that quickly. That was, that was quite something. <laughs> there she is. On a final sweep of the region, we find Jane, whom we first collared, standing in the open. Then nearby, we see the rest of the pride, sleeping off a recent meal in the trees. There are few places in Africa where lions do climb trees and this shasha seems to have the greatest number. Why they like climbing here remains a mystery, whether escaping heat or biting flies, or just enjoying the comfortable fig tree itself. One thing's for certain, they do look relaxed up there.
Back at a local safari resort, Andy shows me the GPS data they've collected on the collared lion's movements. Yeah, so we got the, the foot line we first collared down in the south here, and then the second one, which got up under us, is up here. Would she be going off to, to hunt, following, following prey that way? That's possible, or she could be meeting up with the rest of the pride. Um, one of the things that's a bit concerning, you can see they're right down by the edge of the, the game reserve here, yeah. right next to people who are cultivating. So. With two new collars in place, Andy Plumtree's team, along with the Uganda Wildlife Authority, have their work cut out for them. Tracking these few remaining big cats will be critical in ensuring the future of the tree-climbing lions of Ishasha. No predator features so prominently in human history as the lion. And nowhere is this more the case than in Uganda, where conflict between lions and cattle farmers has always existed. It's no coincidence that as human populations have exploded, so lion numbers have plummeted, to the extent that the tree-climbing lions of Ashasha can now be counted in the tens rather than the hundreds or thousands as in days gone by. The conservation work that I've been privileged to be a part of for the past few days aims to save these lions from extinction, but also to help the communities develop so that neither the people nor the lions continue to suffer as they are today and to guarantee that lions are as much a part of our future as they are of our past. Here at the source of Africa's Nile River, amongst the reeds and swirling eddies, live monsters that are attacking and killing people virtually every week. Nile crocodiles, weighing up to a ton, prowl these waters looking for food. Usually that means fish and any mammal that strays near the shore. But in a land where water is scarce, people must come to the river, and the man-eaters are waiting for them. I've come to the hot, marshy region of central Uganda to join a team of rangers from the Uganda Wildlife Authority who are helping communities by moving man-eating crocodiles away from the villages and into the national parks. The body of the victim, most of it is eaten, and you find they are, whole, they are having only the arm or the leg, or the, the, the upper part without the lower part, and you find the community is grieved. Crocodile this size, person is pretty much the ideal food source. As a biologist, I travel the world through some of the toughest terrain, researching animals to better understand their behavior. Now, I'm on a mission to find the biggest and baddest creatures on the planet. I'm Niall McCann, and I'm here in Uganda, searching for the most feared man-eater in all of Africa, the Nile crocodile. Officially listed as the second largest croc in the world, after Australia's salties, the Nile croc is no small contender. Regularly growing over 5 metres or 16 feet, the largest on record is well over 19 feet. But reports here and in Burundi speak of 7.5 metre crocs, perhaps 25 feet in length. What sets these crocs apart is their aggression. An apex predator, they're stealthy, and watch the movement and behavior of their prey at watering holes. In the recorded cases annually, about 60% are fatal. Because, you know, crocodile attack leaves very fatal injury or death. Nile crocodile's ancestors roamed these waters 200 million years ago. Once endangered, Nile crocs today number in the hundreds of thousands across Africa. And for many living near the water, the spectre of giant man-eating crocodiles is all too real. Recently, a one-ton animal was pulled from Uganda's Lake Victoria. In parts of rural Africa, where running water has yet to be implemented, People are forced to collect their drinking water and to bathe their cows at the rivers and lakes near their homes. As a direct result of this, every single year, literally hundreds of people are eaten by the one animal that routinely hunts people for food, the Nile crocodile. Here in Uganda, 
any time a crocodile attack is reported, a team of wildlife officers are sent to remove the problem crocodile and release it in a national park, miles and miles away from the nearest human habitation. And I've come here to join this team to catch and to relocate the most feared predator in all of Africa, the man-eating crocodiles of the Nile. My journey begins in the cool, fertile, mountainous regions of Uganda, whose waters trickle down from crater lakes or snow-capped peaks to feed the flatlands below. I'm heading northeast towards the hot interior, where the lakes and wetlands give birth to Africa's greatest river, the Nile. Infamous as one of the world's most malarial regions, it's also one of the best places to find enormous crocodiles. So I've come down from the lush tropical forests of southwestern Uganda into the hot, dry center of the country via what must be one of the dustiest roads in all of Africa. And I finally arrived at the greatest source of life in the entire continent, the River Nile, which flows all the way from Lake Victoria to the south to the Mediterranean over 2,000 miles north of here. It's a hot drive along endless dusty roads to the densely populated towns of the Lake Choga region. I'm in the town of Apache, which is quite a bustling metropolis, actually. There's mobile phone masts everywhere and people wearing suits and shirts and that type of thing. But if you go literally 200 metres either side of this bit of paved road, you're out into really, really rural Uganda, where people are living in, in round mud huts with straw roofs. And this part of the world, rural central Uganda, has pretty much the highest birth rate anywhere on Earth. And all of those people need water. Those mud huts do not have running water. They don't even have electricity. They, they have basically nothing but the most basic provisions. So in order to get their water, they're going down to the rivers. And what's waiting for them in the rivers is, again, one of the highest populations of crocodiles anywhere on Earth. And that is creating a really serious issue where literally hundreds of people are being eaten by crocodiles every single year. There have been two recent crocodile attacks on humans here in the last year, and both the crocs remain at large. First, we're investigating an incident involving a young girl, and we're collecting the clues that will allow us to track down the killer croc and remove it from the area. I travel to meet the young girl's family and discover that two cows were also recently taken by crocs. Well, very pleased to meet you, and thank you so much for agreeing to speak to us. It's incredibly good of you, and lovely to meet you too, madam. Mm. I'm joined by Uganda Wildlife Authority ranger Caesar and Samson, a local croc trapper. They're laying eggs on the ground. So you set the traps just near there? Yeah. Sometimes during daytime, like this time, they are watering their cows. So that's when crocodiles come and grab these, the, 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 the animals. So we have to go down. Yeah, we have to go down where, the, where cows are watering. So there's just been these attacks in the last couple of days and the team, Caesar and Samson and the team, have been called in specifically by these local communities who said they've got a crocodile is taking cattle. So they come with a load of nooses that they use and they bait the nooses and the crocodiles hopefully go for the bait and then are caught in the noose. But there was one person we hadn't heard from, the one closest to the attacking crocodile. This child survived a crocodile attack. Hello. Nice, Hello. nice to meet you. Mm. She was sent to bring some cows just here to water. Now when Caesar explains that Panina, the young girl, came down to the river to water her calves, as she does every day. Small, shallow channels cut through the papyrus grass and make for easy access to the water's edge. This convenient watering hole, however, hides hidden dangers. The croc 
just missed Penina, but devoured her calf. Just around the river bend from the calf attack is the site where Samson set the snare, close to a crocodile nest. So we've just found the crocodile nest. Oh. Was this very, very recently? So this, end, so this egg have been eaten. Can either be by white tail mongoose. But mongoose often predate. Yeah, often mongoose. Around mongoose, those of mongoose. But so she would probably have 60 or 70 eggs in there, presumably. Mm, around 60 to 70 eggs. Yeah. There we are. So yet another egg that's been. Oh, this is really. Goodness me, it's been done really freshly. They've just gone in and eaten the fetus or, or the yolk or whatever was left. Oh, it's left a tiny little bit of albumin, which the ants are doing a good job of. A huge proportion of crocodile nests are lost to predation. Now, we know that the female crocodile was near here very recently because Samson's just set his traps. So, no sooner did we arrive and we had a proper scan around because there's very little as fierce as a female crocodile defending a nest. <laughs> We go into the croc-infested marsh to check for anything in the snare. So they've just got the noose. The bait is gone, but no That's crocodile. So she's eaten the prey. Yeah, it does eat the bait. Oh goodness, yeah. Well, she's definitely here. So she's taken the bait, smashed the wire a bit. Let me have a look at the, the snare. Let's see. Little dents in it throughout. Goodness me. And this was only set a few hours ago. Yeah, now's a good idea to get out because not only are we very near just a crocodile's territory, but we're incredibly near a nest. And there's loads of hippo tracks. <laughs> As if crocodiles weren't enough. Nothing on it. We'll rebait the trap, put it back in the water there. And we know it likes this spot. The UWA team resets the snare. And tomorrow, we'll investigate a second recent cattle attack and a tragic human croc encounter. Man-eating Nile crocodiles are on the loose in Uganda's Lake Choga region. So this is where the crocodile was yesterday? Yeah, yeah the yeah. crocodile was here yesterday. I'm visiting a second location, near the town of Apache, where there have been vicious crocodile attacks on cattle and people. see they've been feeding their cattle here. I'm joined by Uganda Wildlife Authority's croc expert, Peter Ogwang and his team to remove at least two of these problem crocs and relocate them. We have the ropes and we have the snares. We're going to set a series along the bank or where would you best want to set them? Peter and his team are seen as heroes come to stop the monster. Today, nearly the whole village has shown up to present us with a list of names of attack victims, including this community leader's son who was killed by a croc. Oh, here we have a list of people who were attacked, uh, those who survived and those who died. So five survivors. The these fatalities. are the survivors. My child. That's your son. Is, yeah. is, I'm so is, sorry. It's called mm. Okao Kons. They were three. And was this recently? When did this happen? Mon last year. Mon last year. Last year. Yeah. 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 Last year. Yeah. So, so these are people who were attacked at this point. Mm. Just at this point? Just this here. point. The chairman asked me who, who lost his son last year. That's one of the children that was killed. Asked me earlier, what are you going to do to help? And I said, well, we're here with, with the UWA, specifically trying to target problem crocodiles, because like with many animals that prey on people, it's often actually just a small proportion of the population that start to target people as food. And crocodiles are one of the only species of animal anywhere on the earth that actually looks at people specifically as food. So if we're able to remove those individuals that are causing the majority of the attacks and relocate those to Murchison, then hopefully the frequency of attacks will drop hugely and we won't see the types of tragedies that this village has been seeing for the last three years. Then we meet Jacqueline, a young woman who barely escaped alive from a croc's jaws. When she came, she entered in water to fetch water, but before she filled the jerkin, the crocodile grabbed her and pulled her underwater. Then the jerkin remained 
floating. The crocodile left her underwater, came and grabbed the jerrycan, went with the jerrycan. After realizing that that was not a human being, it left the jerrycan there and came back. By which looking, time she uh, escaped? Uh, looking for her. But that time she was already pulled out of water. So the crocodile missed her. Uh, from that time she has never come back to fetch water from really? this place. Permanent damage to her arm is only one of the injuries she sustained. The crocodile had her legs and torso fully in its mouth, with devastating results. Uh, she's saying now she's, she cannot do anything. Poor girl, immensely brave. She suffered a horrific attack, which has really impacted her ability to, to work. And as she was saying, most of the people do really rather heavy labour here. And it's quite difficult to find an alternative source of income unless she can get into tailoring or something else. But the problem remains. Crocodiles are still here in large numbers. People are having to go to the water to fetch water every single day. And they're feeding their cows twice a day. The best solution, it seems, is to create some form of partition device like a crocodile cage to stop these attacks from happening. The villagers want this huge crocodile removed from their area before it kills again. And the town chairman is giving instructions on some of the best spots to look for it. I want them first to go and survey somewhere behind here. Because uh, so what they're saying is that this crocodile has some pretty known tactics that it always sticks to. So it comes in on this side and then makes its way over to that point there and then sneaks through the reeds where it can't be seen until it finally mounts its attacks in this bit of clear water right here. Next, we're going to set baited snares in several key locations where the croc is hunting. Do you always use lung? Is that the thing the crocodiles like best? <laughs> this is self-locking wire snare. It is self-locking in such a way that when it moves, it cannot come back. It cannot come back. The fleet of old croc capture dugouts is launched. One poor bugger who just drew the short straw is now walking into the papyrus with a rope and he's going to tie the rope around a big bunch of papyrus and that will act as an anchor. We're then going to have the bait out in this little channel just behind us. Don't really fancy swapping places with him but it would be quite exciting. We're in <laughs> the tippiest, leakiest boat in all of Africa. There's literally a fountain of water coming up. We are slowly but surely filling with water. But it'll be fine. Crocodiles are creatures of habit, and if something is odd in their environment, they're unlikely to go towards it. This is why it's so difficult to trap crocodiles, unless you really disguise the traps as something natural. So in this instance, they're disguising the floater by wrapping it in more of that cow's lung material. So the crocodile's much more likely to take the bait. This is just the first of the traps. Getting in and out of these croc-infested papyrus islands definitely keeps the heart racing. So let's hope as soon as we clear out, the croc goes in. So they say this guy is big and it's obviously been picking off people and animals at a terrible rate. It would be great to be able to catch it and take it away. Put it somewhere where it can't cause any harm. That's my, that's my worry. This is where the croc sometimes takes its kills. Brings them under here, under this rock. Crocodiles are well known for stashing food out of the way so they can then return to it. But they're able to eat literally hundreds of kilos worth of food essentially at one time. They can eat about half their own body weight, which is a ridiculous thought. So if a crocodile would weigh a ton, that means it could essentially put away a 500 kilo cow in a single sitting. Crossing the Nile River in these leaky dugouts is in itself a sketchy prospect. Now add the fact that giant crocs could be waiting inside any of these floating reed mats. It's enough to keep everyone on edge. Now we're going to find a decent place to sit, the third snare. 
Did you say there was a better place behind the papyrus, Peter? So these crocodiles bust behind the papyrus there. Yeah, we are going to set the snare here where it comes out from. So that when it comes out, it will feel the smell of the bait, the meat, and will eat and will be trapped. The chance of catching it is very, very high. Uh, possibly you can even get two. We're here for a week. Let's hope in that week we can catch this marauding crocodile. With multiple traps set for the two man-eaters, we're going to leave them overnight and see if one of the dangerous crocodiles shows up in a snare by morning. So we've come up river to check on the snares that were put out by Samson. So we've got one of the snares here, but it's, it's not been touched. It's just there. So we can see the rope, but we can't see the bait. I'm just going to paddle over, give it a little tug, see whether something pulls at the other end. The bait's gone, but no croc. The trap is reset and tied down. We've come back to the village side of the river to check up on the croc from the first day, the one that killed the girl's calf. So we've come into land, and now we're just going to have to walk along the bank for two or 300 meters to where the snare is set, somewhere down there, and wade out into the papyrus and hope that there's a crocodile at the end of the rope. So we've come back down to this papyrus pool, and there's the crocodile. The marauding female has been trapped, but securing her proves to be more than a handful. This croc is furious and ready to take on all comers. I'm in central Uganda, capturing man-eating crocodiles, then transporting them to a park far away from people. Once again, the village has assembled to see the monster that has been attacking and eating their cattle and any human near the water. The female, whose nest was destroyed by mongoose, is still defending a territory, and she's not going easily. We have to keep an eye out, not only for her jaws, but for her formidable slashing tail. We have to get her bound up and under control. Can we get to do it further? Okay. She's pretty tired already, so we've managed to get her out pretty well. As soon as we get her fully tied up, then we'll get that snare off. Just on eyeballing her, she looks to be about three meters, so 10, maybe 11 feet, which is big size. And if you look at the statistics of crocodile fatal attacks in Africa, the majority are actually carried out by crocodiles that are 10 or 11 feet in size. So when you have real monsters, five meter crocodiles that weigh nearly a ton, humans not even a snack, they want a cow. Whereas crocodile this size, person is pretty much the ideal food source. Okay, there you go, Samson. So straight down the center. We need to get an exact length measurement. All the way down the center, follow the spine line. I'll come down. So three meters, 32. Feet, one inch off 11 feet, three meters 32. Then I notice Panina, the croc attack victim, whose calf perished instead of her. Peter, could you, could, could you ask how, how she feels about, about seeing the crocodile now? Because she, she nearly lost her life to one a few weeks ago. My back was up. She's scared. She feels scared. She feels scared. Well, should we get her down to, to touch it? Because it's, it's totally safe now. And then it's touch it. See? Look at that. Look at that. Fantastic. Uh, this is pretty amazing because only a few days ago she nearly lost her life to a crocodile. And 
this one would be predating up and down this little stretch of river. So it's quite possible that this is the very individual that's, <laughs> well, that took the cow away from her and nearly killed her. And her whole family is there. And, and her mother come down to touch the crocodile. There you go. <laughs> We've got the boat coming in now. Time to get the croc out of here. Going through this croc infested floating reed swamp just seems nuts, but it's the only way to get the captured female into the waiting canoe. <laughs> then our cameraman Tim falls through the floating reeds. He's up to his neck in the croc infested Nile River. Yeah. We'll go back. You good? Yeah. yeah I just need. Yeah. Steady. This is uh, proved rather awkward. <laughs> so this is all just floating weeds, and if I stay here for any more than about 30 seconds, start to sink. Hence, I just had to rescue the camera. <laughs> Crocs there. We kept its head up the whole way because the last thing you want is for water to go into its mouth. Because at this stage, it can't really regulate what's going on with its with its gullet and, and regulating what gets into its stomach and what gets into its lungs. And crocodiles have previously drowned when being caught underwater in a capture situation. So that was my priority here, was making sure that the whole time the crocodile's head was up and out of water, that can breathe and there's no chance of her getting water and now she's there. Are you guys okay or do you need a hand? No, we're okay. You okay? Yeah. 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 Now all that's left is to get myself onto that waiting canoe, full of people next to an angry croc. But the Nile River has other plans for me. During a croc relocation on Uganda's Nile River, I'm nearly fully submerged. Now it's vital to get the croc to shore. Put it in the middle of the boat. Left. Okay. Oh, now it's getting a steady, so it heads up. And that no part is constricted. When you reach, you wait for us to arrive and then you land. Back near the ferry landing, a huge crowd has gathered to witness the 350 kilogram, 750 pound monster coming in. Clearly, every man eater brought in alive has turned Peter Ogwang and the UWA team into hometown heroes who take it in their stride. In the end, of course, both the crocodiles and the people benefit. <laughs> Give her a minute, give her a minute. Yeah, I got it, I got it. You got it? Okay. Okay, put her head up. Okay, so we've got her in the truck and we've got her head up at the front. Just going to retie the back legs so that she's secure. Another thing we want to ensure is that her tail doesn't bend too much because she can cut off the circulation and that could cause some real problems, obviously. But they seem pretty jubilant, they seem pretty happy because, of course, as I've mentioned, every single one of these people's lives are affected by crocodiles on a daily basis. So we've just given her a bit of a bath to cool her down. And she'll need to stay cool for the rough drive ahead. The journey to Murchison Falls National Park takes about two and a half hours over some very challenging roads. If the potholes don't get you, the other drivers might. 
Murchison Falls National Park in northwest Uganda is the country's largest preserve and was a subject of intense fighting during a 1990s civil war. Now wildlife, just recovering here, are facing the prospect of oil development in and around the park, a possible threat to the animal's future. For now, wild locations like this lagoon on the Nile River, teeming with life, are an ideal location for the release of our female crocodile. So, we arrived at Murchison, only a few hours after catching her, and there's dozens and dozens of hippos waiting and watching in the wings. Now we have to carry her off, put her down, and then just allow her to go on her own way, and this is going to be home. Think of many worse places to live for anyone, let alone a crocodile. The fact that there's this many hippos, and this many egrets around, means it must just be teeming with fish, teeming with fish. And that's what we want. You leave that room. Okay, now I'm going to count three and one, two, three, go. Come on, come to Come to sleep. This is the amazing moment when it will take her a little while to realize that she's free again. And of course, she's got to get back some energy. We caught her probably about four hours, four and a half hours ago. We've traveled 100 kilometers in the afternoon to get her here to what is going to be a pretty magnificent place to live. And the story will have a happy ending. There she goes, there she goes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Great work, man. Great work, guys. Great work, Caesar. Brilliant. And what an amazing ending. There she goes, bang, and she is gone. It's an incredible thing that they're, that they're doing here in Uganda. They are allowing these crocodiles to go and live their life somewhere as magnificent as this, as opposed to killing them. It's such a brilliant attitude to take to your predators. You don't get much more serious a predator than that. So she's actually penned in by two sets of massive waterfalls one several miles that way and one several miles that way. So there's no way that she can actually go either up or downstream back to where communities are. You know, many people do not believe that a man eat a crocodile can be captured and released alive. But many times we have done and people have seen it and people have appreciated it. It's very interesting. Uh, we do this because we want to save lives of the communities and lives of the crocodile. We must balance both. So when the crocodile is causing havoc in the community, we have to capture it and bring it back to the protected area where they are supposed to be. Back at the village, we've been told that the bait set for the second croc seems to have been taken, and we rush back to check the snare. So we're back down at the jetty because we got ourselves a crocodile. It's on the north bank, which means it's going to be in the reeds. So we're going to have to drive the boat up to where it is, secure it next to the boat, and then pull it to the other side, which is where the land is. And that's where the fun will start. You might remember that we found a trap the other day which had, had the bait taken by a monitor lizard. We reset it, and then Caesar and Samson moved it just a few meters yesterday. And that's the trap that's caught it, the one that we reset. So we're coming up now. When we get to the trap, we discover a creature much, much bigger than any of us expected. Moving this monster there will be is, extremely is. dangerous. Now we've got it. So we just need to untie the other rope and then drag it all the way. I've been here in central Uganda a week, and we've already caught and relocated one man-eating Nile crocodile. And now we have another on the line. And locals tell me it seems much bigger than the first. Its mouth is shut, it won't open its mouth, so we're going to get a rope underneath its chest and then pull it in. You've seen the size of that thing's head, this thing is huge. It's opening this. Nice. 
now we've got it. So we just need to untie the other rope and then drag it all the way. Oh! There it is, there it is. Okay, go. So we got it now. There's no risk of the ropes getting in the propeller. Osman and I have it here. This thing is huge. I'm going to estimate four and a half meters at least. Four and a half. Massive head. The gargantuan croc has to be dragged to the opposite shore of the Nile, where it can be moved to the truck for transport. There, fish has got. Just get everyone back, Peter. Yeah. Peter, just get everyone back. Just push the boat. The 800 kilogram, 1700 pound reptile seems tired from its struggle. But crocs regain their strength quickly. We got him out of the water. This thing is enormous. It's got about 15 people on the road. We are going to pull. Extra ropes are attached, but the jaws can still open. And with a burst of energy, the croc could send us flying and slice through this group like butter. It's just massive, utterly massive. That's where the power comes from there. The small ropes holding him are not doing much at this point, so we have to pin him down and properly bind and secure him. Now we're tying it up, getting the legs tied. Mouth's already under control, these guys have got it on both sides. Now to see just how big he is. Is the tail straight? One, two, three. 15.3. 4.6 feet. 15.3 feet. Bloody huge. 15, 15 foot three. Now we've we've actually we've added a bit there because you can see it's missing the last uh, approximately 20 centimeters of its tail. 4.6. That's great. So it was 4.42 right to the tip of its of where it's got, but in some battle with some other male or female somewhere along the line of this gargantuan beast's incredibly long life, it's lost the tip of its tail. And to be honest, it's amazing it hasn't lost more. These things, these things are constantly at war with each other. Look at that big wound there by my finger. If you look at crocodile teeth, they're not designed to cut, they're designed to puncture and stay in. They're blunt, they're round. When those things go in, they are sticking. Nothing's coming out of that unless it lets go. I'll get in, I'll get in with Peter. Lifting a beast weighing close to a ton will take some manpower. <laughs> It takes more than 20 people to load the beast into the truck, which is sagging under its weight. The tail does not fit and must be curved in, not ideal for the health of the croc. The trip to Murchison is hours away, and this giant must be constantly moved to avoid circulation problems and possible death. We're gonna need a bigger truck. <laughs> I'm in central Uganda, transporting a giant man-eating crocodile back to the national park. Enormous, that's an incredibly long crocodile. But what I'm amazed about in this one is its mass, its girth. Osman reckons at least 800 kilos. That's truly, truly enormous. Nothing 
nothing can survive this. Like, anything, even a buffalo, is potentially prey to an animal of I this size. It's just insane. Sensation. Pausing in town, Peter and the UWA give the Apache community members a chance to see another monster croc that was stalking their people. Now wrapped up and ready to be shipped away. The father of Panina, the young girl whose calf was snatched by a croc, comes by to show his respect to Peter and the team. Who is sensitizing the communities on the behaviors of crocodiles and how they can avoid being attacked. That is by not standing in water or going to fetch water after darkness and to avoid also fishing in fish breeding areas. Most of the attack on fishermen are when they are fishing in a breeding area. And that's where crocodile also goes to get easy catch. So when it fails to get fish and it sees a human being around, it thinks it's the human being who is finishing its food. So the only thing is to attack that one and eat because he's not getting anything. The UWA have also installed cages in key attack areas of the country so people can safely collect water without fear of attack. Making a bit of a splash in this community, it appears. The benefit of this work is the UWA are celebrated and seen as a solution to the crop problem, which in turn has often made people more aware and more likely to report attacks by predatory crocs. A crocodile of this size has incredible power and could easily break a leg just with the strength of its tail. The rest of the main power is around its head and if it gets hold of you, it's going to smash you to pieces even though you're on land. The vital thing to do is to control its head. Tie its jaws together so it cannot bite. It's then just a game of numbers. You get as many people on its back as you can to restrain it. This is where it's going to get quite interesting because, <laughs> as you've seen, the crocodile's been wriggling quite a bit on the journey. We are going to get down on the croc. He's going to tip it, like a little bit of it, then we control, control this part of it as we put him down. Samson has the head. This will Samson be has the rope. Yeah, good man. All right. So we're going to tip the trailer a little bit just to make it slightly easier, but then we just have to be really careful to make sure that it doesn't bang its head when it comes down. We to be gentle on it as we possibly can be. Okay. Keep it going. Head's moving. Get your arms under there. Let the tail touch that. Okay. Uh, Robert, okay. Go ahead. Drive forwards. Okay. Yeah, I have it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go. 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 Okay. Raise him down. Raise him down. Move. Are we going to turn him around? Watch out for the tail. We move those and put them back on the water. One, 
Off he goes. This is your new home, my man. There he goes, look at that. Look at the power of that. Finally, the big croc slips into his new home, far away from the communities he was plaguing. That went very well. Well done, my dad. We did it, Bob. Can you imagine people having the same kind of jubilant response if it had been killed? No. This is what happens when you actually deal with animals in a sensible way and you keep them alive and you release them. You end up with utter jubilation as opposed to simply the sad sight of yet another animal killed. This is conservation in action. Well done, Uganda, and well done, the Ugandan Wildlife Authority. Well done, my man. Well done, my man. Well done, guys. Today, we have done a wonderful job because we have got the biggest and the baddest crocodile in the village of Ibuje. It's been an absolute dream come true to work with Nile crocodiles. The 4.6 meter crocodile was the 10th crocodile that I have ever caught, made all the better by the fact that we released it again into the wild. It's a fact of life that we share the world with other animals, some of which can eat us. And as long as people continue to collect water from rivers and lakes inhabited by crocodiles, crocodiles will continue to hunt us for food. And in most cases, those crocodiles in turn will be hunted and killed in retribution. But here in Uganda, they do things a little differently. And for me, the enormous thrill of catching a huge crocodiles was completely surpassed by the buzz, the elation of releasing them again into the wild where they belong. This is real conservation, providing a life-saving service for the communities without actually harming the crocodiles at all, as they have just as much a right to life as we do. In the northeast corner of South America, there's an ancient land that's captured the imagination of countless explorers and gold seekers. Over the centuries, these three billion year old Tepui plateaus have both terrified local natives and beckoned Westerners, who believed that treasure, or even dinosaurs, waited for them at the top. Dinosaurs haven't been discovered in the jungle, but a deadly array of venomous creatures has, creating a constant threat for the people that live here. Fairlands is such a nervous snake. Uh, you just walk near it and it strikes. Some of the creatures are so infamous they've become the stuff of legends. I travel to the Gran Savannah region of Venezuela to meet the Paymon Indians and work with them to track down some of the world's deadliest reptiles, insects, and spiders. And they have big fangs as well. Check that out. As a biologist, I travel the world through some of the toughest terrain, researching animals to better understand their behavior. Now, I'm on a mission to find the biggest and baddest creatures on the planet. I'm Niall McCann, and I'm here in the forest of Venezuela in search of jungle venom. While South America's mammals are largely mild-mannered herbivores, various venomous or toxic creatures found in the savannas and jungles demand attention. Snakes like the infamous Ferdinand Lance and the Tropical Rattler possess highly potent venom that affect not only your blood and nervous system, but can actually destroy human tissue, often resulting in amputation. The Bushmaster possesses equally toxic venom and can grow to lengths of 14 feet or over four meters. It's attracted to heat sources 
and is known to chase people in the forest. One of the most painful stings known to man is only a branch away, should your hand touch a bullet ant by accident. From the comfort of our homes in the cities, the idea of these exotic animals living far away in the jungles is almost romantic. But what about the people that live here? So I've travelled far from the city to the remote Gran Savannah region in Venezuela to learn about the realities of living with such dangerous species and to separate the fact from the fiction of Venezuela's most venomous. Buenos dias, amigos. My journey starts in central Venezuela, where I hitch a ride in a Cessna to a small native Pimon community nestled amongst the Tepuy plateaus near the border of Guyana. Venezuela's main industry is extractive minerals and extractive mining. It's highly destructive on the environment. And this is one of the problems that the Bushmasters are suffering. Their landscape is shrinking hugely. Their available habitat is disappearing, largely because of the activities of people. It looks like we're getting ready to land, but there's a problem. Yeah. So we've had to turned back part way. We came over Aoyan Tepui, aiming to reach Kavan, and were blocked off by, by the clouds. So the pilot tried to go through a different way, which was also blocked off, just couldn't see. So now we're backing all the way back up to the northwest, to Kanaima, and we're going to wait, see whether the cloud clears, and try and make our way back through to land in Kavan. Turns out it's not that easy to get to after all. Finally, there's a break in the clouds and the weather clears. <laughs> We're landing on a very small dirt track. The landing seems to go well. Then the plane veers off the end of the runway into the soft sand. arrived here in Kavak, home of the Pimon Indians, where I'm going to spend the next two weeks or so living. This is the type of place where I have the best chance of encountering fertilants, of encountering bushmasters, of encountering bird-eating spiders. It's the places where people are not, that species like this still exist in high enough numbers to have a good chance of seeing them. Great to see you, man. How was your flight? Yeah, it was good. I meet my old friend and guide, Juan Carlos Ramirez. He has a good plan for finding snakes and just heard about a Bushmaster sighting from a local. You're coming. Tessa, let's go meet the guy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, superb. What a backdrop. Mountains, waterfalls. Here we are. Nayel. Hola, Juan. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Can you present to Nayel? Le pasé encima la, la bicicleta y inmediatamente empecé a pedalear, pues, a, por miedo. No que, o sea, me volteé. So it's just three weeks ago, he was cycling back from the village just down there, came around a corner and saw what he said was this, this, this massive snake. So it's the Bushmaster. And he said it was about a meter and a half to two meters long, which is huge and thick like that as well. And quite rightly, he's, he's afraid of it, as you can understand. So instead of trying to touch it, instead of trying to kill it, he just bombed it back to the village, got back and told the story. I lived, I survived, I saw one and I survived. But the great thing is, I know that these snakes don't move around very much. They find themselves somewhere that they're waiting to ambush a prey, a mammal normally, and they will just sit and wait until one goes. So the fact that he's seen one recently, within three weeks, could still be there. So that's the first place we're gonna go. It's not only snakes that terrify. Towering over the village is the plateau named Aoyan Tepui, meaning Devil Mountain. And for centuries, the Pemon refused to ascend its slopes. It's one of the beliefs that gave rise to legends of dinosaurs at the top, which eventually reached the ears of Arthur Conan Doyle, whose book The Lost World, in 1912, paved the way for King Kong and Jurassic Park. Jacey's just spotted some carnivorous plants called sundews. It's a whole little colony here. It's a great one. I suppose it's like a little club with a load of spikes all covered in a droplet of really sticky fluid. 
and when a very unfortunate insect touches that, they get bound and adhered to that fluid. And then it's a protease, which means it's a protein digestive enzyme, and plant just digests the very unfortunate insect while it's out there stuck on these, these little bulb heads. Amazing little thing. There's masses of these sun juice. See them you don't the think about plants as being your mega predators, and yet sometimes plants get the upper hand. Look at the colours. The search for the venomous Bushmaster snake cited by Eduardo continues. It's always hard to try and find things like snakes. Snakes and people do not coexist very well anywhere where they live. And as a consequence, it's difficult to find these animals. So my best chance of finding any of the snakes I want to see is through the help of local people. If that fails, then you have to go back to good old graft. Get out in the field, hike around, turn over every rock and every fallen log and look under everything. Spend as much time as you can searching and that's the best way to find these types of animals. What we do find along the stream bed is a colony of interesting ants who are apparently harvesting the moist vegetation clinging to the rocks. In a mostly dry and inhospitable land, Water is a gift from the tepuis, and ants take advantage of the moisture and nutrients when they can. JC and I have just been chatting, and the gorge gets really narrow just ahead, so there's basically no point us both being there, because one of us can cover both sides looking for snakes. So we think it's probably sensible to split up here. So what, do you, what do you reckon? Yeah, uh, I would say you go to the gorge, I'll check out the ridges, and we'll be back here in a while. Right, an hour or so? An hour or so. Okay, great. Fine. Yeah, see you Good in luck. an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers, man, you too. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. The damp ledges along the edges of streams are one of the best places to look for bushmasters and further lance vipers. One of the fascinating things about bushmasters is that they need high humidity and low temperatures in order to breed and in order to shed their skins. Now they spend 80% underground because it's cold and it's humid. And that's why I've come up here, because in these caves, the humidity is going to be high and the temperature is going to be low. Now I've had a look around and there's nothing here, but I'd really like to have a look at some of the other terraces just a little bit further up the waterfall as well. Just see whether a Bushmaster might be lurking in one of the caves to the side of the fall. It's too dangerous for me to climb upwards, but I could always abseil down. Next, my trip to the top of the falls reveals proof that vipers are up here, and I descend to explore the ledges and caverns below. It's my second day in Venezuela's Gran Savannah region looking for venomous creatures that people here live with every day. Before returning to the falls, I make a quick search along the swollen riverbed for any other clues. One thing I most wanted to see here that lives in holes in banks, I have now put in my snake tube, is that. That is a Goliath bird-eating spider, Therophosa, one of the coolest animals on Earth. Can we see its fangs? If I lift this this way, yes, look at that. Massive pair of fangs under there, which inject protein digesting venom into anything that's small enough for that to eat, which is a lot of things. That includes rats, mice, other insects. Of course, this is a, an arachnid, all manner of things. If a small bird were to go past, of course, it would live up to its name as the bird-eating spider as well. There we go. There we go. That is absolutely superb. That is huge. Massive abdomen. These tarantulas are ambush predators. 
They wait in their silk-lined den for unsuspecting victims to stray nearby. Once they've pounced, they inject a paralyzing venom and an enzyme that also begins to pre-digest the body of the insect or frog, turning it into liquid. To ward off other predators while it's eating, this bird-eating spider uses a spinneret on its abdomen to lay down a ground web that will hold and discourage others from interfering with its meal. If it gets worried and starts to identify me as a specific threat, it will use its hind legs to flick hairs off its abdomen in my general direction. And those can be really unpleasant. If I breathe deeply, if I inhale deeply, I can get them into my throat and it's very unpleasant. I've done it before. The only other time I've come across these in Guyana some years ago. Let's see whether you'll move. You just want it to stay steady. There we go. There we go. That. Oh, it's got its front legs raised. That means it's a little bit aggravated. Fantastic. That is one of my favorite animals on Earth. The Goliath bird-eating spider. These fangs are huge. Absolutely huge. They're tucked up underneath its head and they start all the way out the front. Those fangs are at least a centimeter and a half long and thick. God, just the puncture wound itself would cause a serious injury, let alone the protein digesting venom that they pump into their prey. I return the spider to the forest and JC and I resume our search for venomous snakes. We leave the village far below and head to the top of the waterfall. Check this out, there's a very large snake skin down there. That's a tiny part of it. It is huge. It means that that snake lives here somewhere. So careful where you put your feet and your hands, because it might be under one of these rocks. We've just got to bear that in mind. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and secondly, it means that there may actually be some snakes on the ledges further down, which is why we came here in the first place. So we'll, we should be able to rig a rope up to those trees. Go off the edge and there's about three ledges further down the waterfall that I haven't been able to visit from the bottom up. May well be being used by snakes to come and drink in the shed. a lizard. A little lizard just ran that way. There's a little channel, like a ledge. It's really earthy. There's loads of trees. Wing of a bat. Where you find bats, you find snakes. They absolutely love eating bats. The rope's really greasy, so I'm just going to give myself an extra couple of loops on this prussic, so I use this little rope to control the descent. And it also means if I get hit by a rock that knocks me out and I can no longer control my abseil, that will jam in my belay device, my ATC, and I'll be left hanging as opposed to plummeting. These 
ledges are actually really, really good places for snakes to hang out, especially this one, but mainly at the edge, like here underneath the flow, the snake's not going to sit underneath the waterfall having a shower, let's be honest. But just there, just to the side where the caves are, where I've been looking either side of the main flow, fantastic snake habitat. Despite checking many ledges, rock cracks, and even spotting some mammal trails, I've had no luck here. The snakes just aren't showing themselves, which means I'll have to check back with JC and the Pemon guides in the village about any recent sightings. But first, I have to get out of this gorge, and it's not going to be easy. I have just come down a massive waterfall in Venezuela on a search for venomous snakes. Now my only way out and back to camp is through this. the word out to locate snakes, but both the Ferda Lance Viper and Bushmaster remain hidden, in more ways than one. We've been really struggling to get people to talk to us, because they just don't like snakes, and Bushmasters least of all. But there's an old man who lives just outside one of the villages who's happy to talk to me about some of the mythology or the creation myths they have surrounding the Bushmasters, which is fantastic. About half an hour ago, a woman from one of the other Pimon villages came in and said that her brothers are both hunters, and they know how to find Bushmasters. They've been hearing them. They shouldn't make a sound, but I've heard rumors from various Indian groups, various indigenous groups, that they do make sounds, so I'm really interested in this. And if they reckon they can find them, then fantastic. It's a fascinating story. He said he always used to go to the forest with his father and they would go hunting and, and, and fishing out high up, in the higher altitudes deep in the forest. And at night only, they would hear this sound and it would travel around the camp or they would search different areas they'd always hear this sound and whenever they managed to locate the sound they never actually saw the snake making it but they located the sound they would always find a quima binia a bushmaster in an area that it had cleared so a clear area just coiled up and even more stories are told throughout the americas of bushmasters attraction to heat sources such as campfires then attacking the people next to them He also mentions something which is fascinating because I've heard this from herpetologist friends of mine that if you're wearing a headlamp they'll actually strike at the headlamp so if you're walking at night in the forest he implores you not to wear a headlamp but to carry it in your hand instead just in case it happens to strike at you because it might even knock your torch out of your hand which is, which is quite a thought. Myth or fact, I decide to test this theory by wearing the headlamp and pursuing the Bushmaster and other venomous creatures in the nighttime jungle. I am staggered at the number of spiders. Now, I'm used to the tropics and I'm very, very used to the near tropics to Latin America. This place has just got a higher density of spiders than I've seen anywhere before. There's another massive one just there. This place is insane. Oh, and then there's a load of ants eating something up here. That was one of the winged, that'd be a winged termite. There was a huge swarm of winged termites came out earlier. That'd be one of the queens because it's so much bigger. And it's being chomped on by ants. Big spider down there. It's just absolutely everywhere. Whoa! Spider obviously feels that this 
little bit of moss is its property. Didn't want me to touch it. Sorry, little man. That was quite something. Yeah. First time I've been attacked by a spider this trip. Oh, you bastard. Then I uncover a creature more feared by locals than even a jaguar or snake. Normally, I am pretty comfortable handling feisty animals. <laughs> this is one of several species of the infamous bullet ants. I'm on a night hunt for venomous creatures in Venezuela's Lost World region. This is one of several species of the infamous bullet ants. So called because when stung, and they have a sting on the end of their abdomen as well as having fearsome jaws, when stung by these, it is supposed to feel as if you've been shot. They are called the 24 hour ant. The reason they call them that is because for 24 hours you feel like death. It makes you throw up, scream in agony, and be essentially paralysed by pain. And we're talking serious pain. On the Schmidt Sting Pain Index, the bullet ant is at the very top, about 30 times worse than a standard bee or wasp sting. In laboratory experiments, the sting of a bullet ant kills a lab mouse three or four times quicker than a scorpion or even fertile lance. If you live in forested areas of Central or South America, the ant is a constant threat. A careless hand placed on a tree or an open hammock in the jungle invites the worst pain humans can experience. One that builds until the victim often slips into unconsciousness. Measuring up to an inch in length, bullet ants live in colonies, but unlike most ants, they seem to be true predators and can usually be seen alone wandering through the forest looking for food. They're hunting for other insects, nectar or water. Get back down the path. With no reptiles spotted on the night hunt, I'm going to have to try another tactic in the morning. The Pimon villages are surrounded by the Tepuis, Plateaus formed from the oldest rocks on Earth and shaped 150 million years ago when the continents of South America and Africa broke apart. Today, I'm seeking out other Pimon Indians to help me locate the venomous creatures here. For many of them, especially the snake bite survivors I speak to, the Bushmaster and Ferdelant snakes that I'm seeking are terrifying. They'll, they'll lock onto the prey and then they will leap. You said two meters, was it? Yes. They'll, they'll jump two meters, which is remarkable thought. And they will leap and leap again until they've got hold of their prey. And he says it's much more dangerous than any of the other snakes around here, which is, which is quite a thought because there's some pretty staggeringly dangerous snakes around here as well, with fertile lance and yeah. rattlesnakes and coral snakes. But the bushmaster sits on top of them all. It seems. Yes. To find the elusive snakes. I've got to go further into the jungle. JC and I have come down to the river to try and, well, rope some people into helping us to find these snakes, because the local indigenous, the Pimon people, have been really, really reticent to help us, because they're just too afraid of the snakes. Uh, it's almost embarrassing to ask them, because they're so afraid of this animal. Yeah. And also the other thing, we're going to be going a couple of hours downstream, so further away from people, there's more yes. chance to find snakes. Nobody around, so it's going to be good. Yeah. Well, let's load up. Yep. To boost our chances of getting the latest snake sighting reports, we bring along Alex, a Pimon guide from the area, who's worked with JC before. It's a three-hour journey upriver. 
past some amazing jungle scenery and deep into the territory of the Pomon. One of the ways that the local people do a lot of their farming and their hunting is by burning. And that, of course, creates a situation where any of the animals inside the burned area are fleeing to escape. So it's much easier to see snakes under those circumstances. So anywhere we're coming across someone that's gardening or hunting using that technique, we'll ask them whether they've seen any, because it's going to be one of our best chances of seeing these incredibly elusive animals. Alex does a quick check for snake eyewitnesses, but is having some difficulty. Pretty much only one person in the village that will talk to us. Everyone else is just afraid. Yes, they really fear the snake. And they don't want to. They don't want us to ask them where it is because they feel embarrassed about it. The one guy that will talk to us is apparently Alex was saying just down at some rapids. So we better get back in the boats and head downstream. But the route to that one informant has one small obstacle. These. The heavy dugout is jammed on the rocks, and it's going to take every man on board, plus help from local villagers, to apply leverage and pull the craft to clear water. proves strong and we might just be stopped dead in our tracks. Our expedition to find venomous further lance and bushmaster snakes in Venezuela has got stuck in the rapids and it's going to take all the people at hand to get this canoe over these rocks. Finally free, we're actually on the lookout for a Pomon Indian in a canoe who locals have told us has information about the location of these particular snakes. We head further and further upriver. Then we spot him, but it turns out his information is hardly current. Three months ago, this guy saw two bushmasters. He's near him. Uh, they're burning. Of course, they got their skin. They escaped too. Well, they're definitely here. Come upstream now, further away from people. These guys are living in a much, much more remote area. And this is where the bushmasters are obviously residing. That guy saw two only three months ago. The further away we get from habitation, the more likely we are to see them. As we begin a new search, distant thunder reminds us it's the start of the rainy season in this part of Venezuela. If they came in this way, then they've already looked that way, so I'm going to look up towards this little ridge, not cover the same ground. That is nuts. Then, just under my feet, a pink fur ball with an attitude. This is something else you don't want to get stung by in the jungle. That, believe it or not, is a caterpillar. And it is incredibly well protected. There's different types of camouflage in the natural world. Some things are meant to disguise. Other things hide in plain sight. This is advertising itself as not to be trifled with. If you were to brush your hand against any of those hairs, it would be absolute agony. And I've just got lucky. I've never accidentally brushed my hand against one or 
had one drop down my shirt, all of which has happened to friends of mine, and all of which suffered the consequences. This is likely the larval stage of a type of flannel moth. Beautiful to the eye, but in this case, they start life out as something pretty brutal. <laughs> An eating machine armed with poison darts all over its body. Searing, searing pain is how it's been described to me. Just horrendous. I don't know whether it's safe to have it walk on you, so I'm not going to take any chances, and I'm going to take my finger away now. Get the mosquito that's on my forehead. And now on my nose. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and it fell onto my shirt. Thankfully, not down it. Go on, little man. Before you cause me any more strife. Put him back before something else happens. I resume my search for fertile lance or bushmaster snakes. Bushmasters and other vipers and ambush predators are incredibly well camouflaged. They have these rhomboidal, kind of triangular patterns down their bodies that makes them basically just disappear into the leaves. So in order to find stuff, oh, is someone shouting? Sure. Snake! 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 Well, there is a snake, but not quite what I expected. So in Latin America, anything with a diamond-shaped head is going to be pretty unpleasant. Whereas skinny, fast-moving things with narrow heads are largely fine. There are exceptions, <laughs> vine snakes, for example. But on the whole, that's a pretty good rule. Are you a baby racer? Or what do you reckon? Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, Lima Dofis. It's um, a colubrid. Colubrid, yeah. Colubrid, yeah, so yeah. Ba baby racer. Yeah. Beautiful facial coloration. It's kind of like a yeah. parent snake would have. There you go, little man. It's quite comfortable in my hand. I release this harmless racer and head down to the creek bed, where we find one of the most poisonous animals in the world lurking under a rock. Here it comes. Here it comes. There, look at that. Fantastic. That is the famous, or one of the famous, poison arrow frogs, poison dart frogs, Dendrobates. What a wonderful animal. Good spot, JC. There it goes. If passed through cuts in human skin, this little guy's toxin could kill as many as 10 people and cause death in seconds. The frogs accumulate this toxicity by eating insects around them that are themselves poisonous, creating batrachotoxin, 10 times deadlier than the tetrodotoxin in the infamous pufferfish. Amazonian Indians have found a unique use for this, as arrow poison. In this region, the Pimon dip their blowgun darts in the plant-based curare poison, but elsewhere in the Amazon, the poison dart frog is used to kill animals. Alex gives me a demonstration. He's trying to hit that plant. Ha! It's insane! <laughs> Alex! Alex! Incredible! Toca. Ahora te toca. Toma. Ah. Now it's my turn. This is going to be culturally embarrassing. I'm quite good at throwing a cricket ball. You need a bigger target. <laughs> need a, yeah, Bueni yeah, there. Con, con mis labios al fuera. Sí, al fuera. Labios al fuera. Y agarra impulso. 
Yeah! <laughs> in one! Yes, get in! <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, yes, there you go. <laughs> Later that evening, I come across another poison dart frog. I didn't really want to catch it with my bare hands because, of course, the poisonous part is the skin, but I didn't really have that much choice as it was making a beeline for an escape route. But it's just absolutely spectacular. I've got to be very careful. Well, I, I couldn't have picked this up if I had a cut on my hand, for example, because if any of the toxin got from its skin into my bloodstream, then I could be in quite serious trouble. There he goes. Off to hop another day. The next morning, word comes in that a dangerous snake has invaded a village hut, and I need to get upriver to help the family and see if we finally track down our elusive Ferda Lance or Bushmaster. It's day seven of my visit to Venezuela's Grand Savannah region, and I've come across another amazing adaptation to this harsh land. Just found one of my favorite things about South America. It's a leaf cutter ant colony. Put that one back there. They slice their environment into little bits, carry it back here to their nest. And the nest is everything that, that, that what we're on. It's probably 10 meters that way. And it goes all the way over there. Well, you can see the raised bit of ground there would have been the form of major strongholds, but there's holes all the way here. So this entire thing that I'm standing on is the giant colony of the leaf cutter ants. Now they carry all these little bits of leaf, they take them underground, and then they grow fungus on them. And they eat the fungus and they feed the fungus to their larvae. This guy here carrying the leaf is essentially helpless if something were to come and try and attack him because he's laden down with something that weighs almost as much as he does. But this little guy here, just walking up to my finger, is there to guard him. It sits on top of the leaf as they're roaming around and if anything comes to try and attack this chap, and normally that would be a wasp that would come and try and attack him, the little bulldog on top will snap away and scare it off. There they go. Fantastic. Then the call we've been waiting for comes in. A dangerous snake was found in a village hut two hours from here and the locals would like us to come and take it away. They've left one of their mates with it, just to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. I hear the dog getting nervous. It's close to their house, that would be concerning for them. If it is as venomous as they suggest it is, the last thing you want is a venomous snake around the house, around their children. It looks like the owners have already taken some precautions. <laughs> they, they, I'm amazed. Como lo agarré? Como lo capturan? That's nuts. So it actually came into their house and he pinned it with a little fork stick and then put it underneath the bucket, which hopefully for us is going to have calmed it down. That tends to be what happens. With their home situated in a man-made jungle clearing, this Pimon family is all too familiar with venomous snakes and other crawling creatures in their huts, including this giant cockroach. Absolutely enormous. It's absolutely huge. Hey, little guy. Fantastic. The reason I carry a bag with me when I'm out herping, out looking for snakes, is because if you put them in a bag and it gets dark, they tend to calm down. So they've put it underneath a bucket. Let's hope it's nice and calm when it comes out. On the other hand, it will have warmed up and will be even faster and more feisty than normal, potentially. Okay. You all ready? Yeah, that is a Bothrops. Beautiful. Wow, that is a Ferda Lance. Beautiful. Absolutely stunning. So it's a lance head snake because it's got this 
spear-shaped head. That is absolutely spectacular. Though small, this further lance packs a powerful cocktail of blood, nerve, and tissue-destroying venom. Further lance are responsible for more fatalities in Central America than any other snake. Even with prompt treatment, their bites frequently cause massive tissue destruction and then amputation. Growing up to eight feet long, further lance typically inject double the lethal dose for humans. So this guy is packing some serious venom, both hemo and cytotoxic. So not only are you gonna hemorrhage badly, your blood will coagulate and it has cell destroying venom as well, cytotoxic, which serves the great function as far as the snake's concerned, of partially digesting its meal before it gets into its stomach. That is absolutely superb. And it's an ambush predator. It'll just sit and wait in the leaves and wait for something to go past. And then using its heat sensitive pits, which you'll see just in front of its eyes, it'll spot any change in temperature going past it. Bang, it's gonna smack the next thing that moves. Pump it full of some seriously toxic venom. Hello, little thing. I love all snakes. This is only the second one of these I've ever seen. And I am enchanted. That is superb. You seen many of these? Um, they're, they're quite common. But of course, they're being killed as we speak. Yeah. One of the great shames about people is we try and remove all threats from our environment. Yes. And this is a pretty serious threat. These are worthy of all of the rumors you hear about them. Now, this one's being amazingly calm, partially because I'm being gentle with it, and partially just because of the personality of the snake by itself. But they have a reputation for coming out swinging. If they feel threatened, they will just charge and fire at anything and everything that moves. This guy is being really calm, but I'm being as gentle as I can with it, and that's certainly helping the situation. Here's that, there we go. Time to get this venomous visitor out of here and back into his forest home. I was incredibly lucky. We just saved the snake. <laughs> yeah, I'm delighted we I'm so saved happy. the family, but I'm thrilled <laughs> that the snake's gonna live. Normally they just, just kill it. Yeah. There it is, there it is, there it is. Fantastic, look at that. It's actually a bit more prepped than I was expecting. <laughs> I was expecting it to be all totally calm, but it's not, it is ready. This is gonna be your new home, my man. And that one was very, very calm with us because we were really calm with it. And now it, off it goes. It won't bother that family that were very generous and called us. And it's going to live to hunt many, many more days after that. Fantastic, great stuff. Sadly, at the end of the week, the famously elusive Bushmaster remains just that. But other creatures did not disappoint. I came to Venezuela to learn about living with venomous species highlight of this adventure for me was capturing a further lance, the most dangerous snake in all of the Americas, in a remote family farm and releasing it again far from harm's way. Over the course of this trip I've encountered a remarkable array of venomous and poisonous species. I hope that our attitude towards venomous species changes so that they're no longer viewed with fear but with intrigue, so that species like the further lance can continue to captivate us long into the future. <laughs>